Welcome to 365 Brothers, the podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Robin Shine, and get ready for another episode where I introduce you to another amazing, interesting, intriguing, and inspiring African-American man from the United States. They come from a variety of professions, various parts of this nation, and all of them bring their wisdom. So chill out, relax, listen in. Make sure you follow us. We're on Instagram at 365 Brothers. Also, you can go to 365brothers.com backslash Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R-E-E, 365 Brothers backslash Linktree. You'll find links to all things 365 Brothers, as well as links to anything Robin Shine. Again, thank you and let's listen in. Our guest today worked as a vice president of marketing for Xerox Corporation. Back in the day, this was a top 100 Fortune 500 corporation. He also has 18 years of experience in wealth management. And let me just tell you a little bit about him. So he's a member of Ed Slot's Master Elite Advisor Group. He's currently a member of Ed Slot's Master Elite Advisors. It's a group that's dedicated to solving some of the most complex retirement issues. And you guys know that is something that's so important to me as an economics teacher. He's appeared on the Hoodie and Tie show on K-Day LA. And this is something you really want to know. During the 2008 market crash, his wealth management company had one of their most successful years. And that's both in preserving client wealth and acquiring new clients. So that says a lot. His success is based on his belief in a holistic financial planning process. I'm super excited to share with you, Mr. Andre Hall. Welcome, Andre. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this time we uh, have a spend together. All right. Well, let's start off with the getting to know you part. So what is a favorite song or movie, either now or all time? Well, one song, two people. Okay. Uh, uh, George Benson and Whitney Houston. So the greatest love of all, basically my favorite song. Yes, <laughs> yes. Initially, George Benson played it, sung it, and then Whitney Houston. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, I haven't heard that name, George Benson, in such a long time. Oh yeah. man, oh, he, he is he good. Was amazing. He, when you said you hadn't heard his name, I I have to say I haven't heard it either. But he he is such a talent. Mm-hmm. I can't help but I have to mention on Broadway. Oh my gosh, what he did with that song. <laughs> yep. I don't even know if that's the title, but that's all I remember. <laughs> on Broadway. <laughs> Sorry. <Yep. laughs> Fantastic. Love them both. And what's a favorite moment from your childhood? One of the things I remember from my childhood is when my older brother, he's graduating from high school when you're uh, in elementary school. We, we didn't do a whole lot of things together. Mm-hmm. One day, he was nice enough, instead of going with one of his high school friends, we caught the bus from South Central L.A. to, back then, the Dodgers were playing in the Coliseum. Okay. Before Dodger Stadium. Caught the bus, and we went to a double hitter. He took me to a double wow. hitter. And it was the... Two of my favorite pitchers of all time, Sandy wow. and Don Drysdale pitching. You probably don't know who they are. I know the names. But I believe Sandy Koufax was the greatest pitcher of all time. And okay. I got to see him up close and personal. And that was a real exciting day for me. I had a lot of fun. Enjoyed being with my brother. You know, it's funny. It didn't happen right then all at once. Mm-hmm. We started having a different kind of relationship after that. Then, you know, mm-hmm. the normal big brother, little brother beating him up. And, you know, we shared a bedroom, obviously, back in those days. He'd be watching TV and tell me, turn my head. Uh, and, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you're supposed to be asleep. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like, and I have to say that I remember 
Five days after graduating from high school, he went into the Army. Joined mm-hmm. the Army, was going to make it a career. Decided not to after a while, after he got in there, found out what it was all about, went to school, got his degree, then got his law degree, went with the uh, Federal Trade Commission, then with the Justice Department, then became a federal judge. And we had a great, great relationship. And after he retired, he, he had a routine. In the morning, he would get up, go play tennis, go to breakfast, then go to the beach and sit on the beach and read for three to four hours. Uh, had a heart attack at breakfast one morning, was only 67, and uh, passed away. But when I think about him, one of my happiest remembrance of him back when we were young, and then now, probably the three saddest days of my life, him passing, my mother and my dad. But three saddest days of my life. So, right. Wow. My condolences. So it's been a while now, but I appreciate okay. so many things. So first of all, I can appreciate how we are when we're older by that much to take that time and just the two of you doing something that mattered to you so much. What I hear is that that day really shifted your relationship. What role do you think your parents played in that day? None. No? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. And it says so much about his character. He Um, was a good person. Yeah. And he turned out to be, you know, a good brother. Hey. (laughs) A good big brother. (laughs) They don't always go together. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) They don't. (laughs) Awesome. When you're surrounded by people who care that way, when you've grown up with that amount of love, it's hard not to have accomplishments that mean a lot to you. And so I asked this question about accomplishments in two parts. First, an accomplishment that means the most to you personally, Andre, and then the one that gets the ah uh, or mm, most often when heard. So which accomplishment of the many that you have is the one that means the most to you personally? I've done a lot of different things in my career, but one group that I ran inside of Xerox, it wasn't a big group. I ran much larger groups than this particular group that I'm referring to, but it was a group pushed to the side. It was dealing with used equipment, but the big four accounting firm that was Xerox's auditors at the time We're going to force Xerox to take an extremely, and I'm not talking about a few million or even a few hundred million, an extremely Mm -hmm. huge write-off. If Mm -hmm. uh, and have a strategy and a plan to dispose of that equipment, uh, when I say dispose, sell that equipment. Okay. And, And I was able to come up with a strategy, a plan, and implement that strategy and plan with a small group of people that enable us to be successful in avoiding that for Xerox. And not only avoided that, but we were able to bring in overall, including the supply revenue and everything else, an extra five or six hundred million dollars. Yes. The thing about it, it was fun because nobody bothered me because no one knew what to do. I didn't have a lot of people looking over my shoulder telling me, okay, don't do that. Don't do this. I said, basically, I got the money I needed, and we made it successful, and it ended up being great, a great time and a fun time. And I can't say that about very many jobs. (laughs) You know, they could be satisfying, but not fun. (laughs) Right. And that was fun. Because I hear that you were given a lot of freedom, right? Yes. Uh, I can hear the essence of wealth management being applied there, right? You're making sure that they're getting maximum value for these products that they've created. And are are we talking like um, a refurbishing program? Yes, we are. We're talking about equipment that had been out on lease and they had a certain book value on them. And then coming back off of lease, they're sitting in the warehouse. And the auditors saw that and said, they can't continue sitting in the warehouse. Uh huh. And you found a way for that to become profit. Yes. Now, I, as someone who loves to create a project and you know what I mean? Like I really do enjoy solving a problem. 
for me, it's mostly things around time or things about having processes work better, be efficient. It's definitely often, like you said, it's very often very satisfying. I don't know how often it's fun. So I'm curious what aspect about that was fun. Was it the freedom itself or what was it in the doing of it that was fun? You know what? It was several things. Number one, it was definitely the freedom. Number two was the people, the group that I built around it. We all liked each other, surprised me enough. <laughs> That's what always happened in that corporate world. Nice. And so we had that going for us. And then it was just how we went out and executed. And we just had fun doing it. We would do our little lunches and dinners and different things while we were out executing because we would do warehouse sales. We would do sales in uh, hotel ballrooms, online sales. We would do a lot of different things back then. And this was in the uh, 90s. Uh, okay. There weren't a lot of on- online sales back then. Uh, right. But we did a lot of different things to enable that success. So it was fun. Wow. And I, I also hear that you created a true team environment. How intentional were you in fostering that kind of environment? Uh, very intentional. And it wasn't a large group. It was about 30 people. So it wasn't a large group. And sometimes if it's a thousand people, it's much harder to foster that. It's much harder to foster that kind of mm-hmm. environment. Uh, mm-hmm. 30 to 35 people, we were able to foster that and the camaraderie and uh, working together and helping each other. And uh, when something happened where someone else need help with the piece they were carrying out, it wasn't like people would step back and say, that's not my responsibility. Mm. but join in, hop in, and help that person. And it became everybody helping each other. Hey, sounds like a sports team that's working well. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What about the accomplishment that most often gets the, uh uh-huh, or wow, which one is that? It's a funny thing. And this was when I first became a uh, VP at Xerox. The group president decided he needed to focus in on three areas. And I got one of these three areas, which in my case, it was legal. And we came up with, and I didn't invent the product. I just market the product because it hadn't even come out of development. And it was never going to come out of development until I stepped in and said we needed it and wanted it. And so we got it out of development. We took it to the legal field and the product, it was an accessory that for a product family that it went on. And by putting it on that product family, which happened to be the most profitable product family that Uh was dying, I won't say dying, but not producing anywhere close to the revenue it was supposed to produce. And okay. We were able to come up with uh, a number of different marketing programs. But the funny part of it was we call it the litigator. Said mm-hmm. how it put simple thing, numbers on pages automatically coming out of the printer. Okay. When it hit the accessory versus having to do it after Get the your printer. document. Yeah. It, it, it was a whole serious savings of time, steps, and money. I travel all around the country speaking to the largest legal firms in the country, meeting with the partners, explaining and clearly articulating exactly what this was going to do for their firm, reduce costs, increase productivity. And I sent out this package called the Litigator. These big, it wasn't a box, but it was like five or six inches by two and a half feet. And I would send those out to all the attorneys. Uh Think about uh, when we were sending it to a law firm and they have uh, a thousand attorneys. So their mail rooms were getting clogged up. Oh, wow. Boxes. But guess what? It really made them all take notice. And that was the most successful year ever for that product family. And we're talking about billions. 
Uh, nice. Was the most successful year ever for that product family. So it's kind of funny because they 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 call the CEO of Xerox and say, stop spending these. <laughs> 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 Some of the larger law firms, not small. Yeah. Law, because, yeah. You know, you you got Scott Art, you know, you get 2,000 of these things in their mail room. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got some phone calls. <laughs> okay. And, and you got some calls about that, but it translated into billions of dollars in revenue. Uh, and I don't want to take complete, yeah. I'm at, what's his name, Santos. I don't want to take complete credit <laughs> for all of those dollars in, yes. in enable us to make the plan for that product family which in return was billions, and which in return, quite frankly, was 70% of the profit margin inside of Xerox. We call that mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so I have to ask, so, so Xerox has these different divisions or different areas that they're working on, and they're looking to increase revenue in their services to the, in their products going to law firms. And there was a, something that they already had with the numbering, but they weren't applying it here and targeting there. And so it, it was taking something that they had, but combining it with something else that really. That plus the fact that no one thought it could be successful, that product. Yeah. No one thought it could. So it probably would have never gotten launched. Oh, you know, I've always been one of those kind of guys, not enough. And you'll hear that later on uh, okay. to think it out of the box, doing things that other people didn't think could happen, be successful. And it was the same thing with the uh, use equipment. I didn't invent certified pre-owned, but that's what I renamed that group when we were doing okay. equipment. Certified pre-owned before it was just used equipment. Yes. The auto industry invented that, but I took that up and translated to our product set and uh, made people feel like they were basically basically getting a, a new piece of equipment almost yeah. at a much reduced rate and that we had guarantees around it. And that yeah. I established. So yeah. those are the kind of things I relished and enjoy being involved with. A lot of times we hear somebody has some title, you know, um, they're the CEO, they're the VP, they're CFO, whatever. And we know that they work hard, but we often don't get an insight into what was their particular kind of genius. And so just in how you shared some of the work you did in Xerox, like I really get your creativity around problem solving. And I think a listener can understand how you rose to vice president because you're literally coming up with new things, new ways of seeing old things and transforming the bottom line for people, which is a perfect <laughs> background for wealth management. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you want yep. to know somebody can really impact that bottom line in a very positive way. And so it's like, okay, yeah, okay. I see you in your wealth management. I see you. <laughs> Well, you know what? The reason that I got into wealth management is that I had several folks that worked for me, either they passed away or their spouse passed away. And people were lost as to what to do next. And they would come in and just in the beginning, just talk in general, you know, they're depressed. I'm a pretty good listener, usually. And they would just come in and talk. And so I started helping these folks with their thought processes and the things that needed to be done, the steps that needed to be taken based on where they were and what they had done and hadn't done. And then I also uh, just started studying up. This was long before I left the corporate world and mm -hmm. started in uh, wealth management as my profession. So I started doing that because of that and helping these people get through a very, very sad point in their lives, helping them get through that in a way that they didn't get hurt. Because a lot of advice they were getting out there, it was clear, it was amazing to me, it's still amazing today. You see this all over in every profession. You see 
with teachers. You see it with attorneys. You see it with financial advisors. You see it with uh, doctors. I was just talking to a client today uh, about doctors and someone who had kidney stones and her doctor told her, oh, it's just stress. Go see a psychiatrist. And they had kidney stones. And I'm saying, why are you still with that doctor? <laughs> mm -hmm. But my point is that they were getting a lot of bad advice from the advisors that they were going to see. Even a couple of cases, I went with them to make sure the package that was being offered to them mm -hmm. from the advisor was the right program for them to accept and mm -hmm. for their situation. That's how I really started thinking about it. I started thinking about this profession before I left the corporate world. And once I left the corporate world, that's why I went into it. That's that's awesome. I had a, a networking group in a way. And one of them, um, year after we stopped interacting, he went into financial management. He was being trained by some other advisor. And he assured me this person worked with educators all the time, this and that, right? I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a meet. I'm very happy with what I have. But, you know, yeah, let's sit down. So we sit down and the guy that is supposed to know all this stuff, I'm like, okay, but you're like not getting a couple of the terms I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and you're telling me you specialize in educators. There's no way you specialize in educators and you don't know these two things, right? And yep. no matter what you're doing, I don't care whether you're looking for a good doctor, a good attorney, a good financial advisor. You got to do your due diligence. Yes. Or uh, what you're searching for, you have to do your due diligence. I tell anyone that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm very good. Um, I have a lot of uh, broad based experiences, not just the edge book experiences, but real life experiences, especially with working with small business owners and corporate execs and things of that nature, uh, doctors after we've, but I'm not perfect. No one is perfect for everyone out. Truth all around. <laughs> Let's talk about words. What's a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? Failure to plan is planning to fail. Uh. We learned that at Xerox in our, when you first became a manager, and I still think it holds true. If you don't plan, whether you're talking about your career, yeah. Or running a department, launching a small business, and you don't have not just the business plan overall, but a specific marketing plan inside of there. Mm. If you have all mm. of those things laid out, mm. you can't be successful. So mm. failure to plan is planning to fail. Mm. Okay. See, now you're just preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about um, some of your experiences. What is a conversation, moment, or event that either changed the trajectory of your life or had a significant impact on your life? Being a kid, elementary school, doing the watch riots mm. in 65. With tanks rolling up and down the streets <laughs> that, you know, you, you used to just walk down there to the stores and whatever. And guys riding in Jeeps with machine guns. Bow, and they're, they're holding on to these machine guns. They're sitting mm. ready to fire those machine guns. Mm. And, mm. and my father told me, you stay home. You don't go nowhere. And he mm. said, I'm not going anywhere either. Now, my father fought in World War II. He had a bullet in his leg he carried for all his life from World War II. Mm. He fought in the Korean War, and he fought in Vietnam. Wow. So this was a guy that um, had been through a lot, and I'm sure it had to pain him to tell me that as a black person and a black male, I couldn't go outside. Uh, as, as much as he had given for his country, uh, yeah. uh, for him to have to say, 
Even he can't go outside. As much as he's given for his country, it, it have to pain him. And so that is something that I'll never forget that conversation. He taught me a lot. It was actually my stepfather, but he raised mm -hmm. me at the age of six. Mm -hmm. And I consider him my father, father. Yes. Uh, he taught me no one was ever going to give me anything. I remember when uh, I had the opportunity to go to a few schools, but I, I wanted to get to USC back then. Uh, okay. And so I went to a JC and I told my dad, okay, dad, I need money for books. That's about $50. And I need $6 and 50 cents to register. That's all the cost back then. Uh -huh. And I grew up mowing lawns and washing cars. And he didn't say anything. He said, come on, son. He took me out to the garage. I said, my, what is he got? A stack of a stash of money in the garage? And he pointed to that push law more that I've been using. <laughs> oh, oh. Never been sharp. And he said, son, that's how you're going to get your book money. And that's how you're going to get your uh, registration money. And my father taught me, I love my dad. But wow. uh, uh, he wasn't giving up a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't, you know, yeah, make a right. lot of money. But I love my dad. And right. he was, uh, he taught me a lot. He taught me how to be self-reliant. And that's what Black fathers need to do a better job of. I have a 19-year-old that I'm, I've been too easy on, giving him too much. I got to teach him how to be self-reliant. Yeah. I got to do a better job. Uh, just being here today makes me realize just saying what I had just said about my dad, I got to do a better job than what I've been doing. And that's something we all have to do. Yeah. 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 I, I can't help but think about the through line of you asking and him going here, I'll show you exactly how that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and, and you, and, and the faith, also, though, because you'd already evidence that you knew how to make money, you knew how to hustle, if you want to say hustle or whatever, you know, to get the clients to do the lawn mowing and all the other things that you did while you were young. And so I can't help but see the through line to you managing wealth because, you know, it's like you got to make it <laughs> and you can. <laughs> yep. You you got to you got to build your wealth and you can. That's cool. What's a moment that stands out as some way either signifying or um, exemplifying uh, your experience as a Black man in the United States? Well, you know, I was just looking at something online. He was basically beaten to death in Memphis, Tennessee on January the 7th this year. Tyree Nichols. They fired the five police officers that did it. Now, that only happened January the 7th. They've already fired those five police officers. This was a black man being beaten. But I'm going to be blunt. Please. The only reason they fired those five police officers this quickly, because they were all black. Mm. Shame that... There were five black men. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have been arrested. I don't know all the facts behind that. I have no idea. But he shouldn't have been beaten to death. We're talking not even bad enough when you get shot once or twice. We're not talking about that. We're talking about beating him to death. Yeah. So you don't have to beat someone to, to a pulp to arrest yeah. No. Uh, yes, they knew somebody needs to be fired. But we know if it had been five white officers, even if maybe eventually they would have been fired, maybe, and some of them, probably not all five, maybe two of them or whatever, but it wouldn't have happened in uh, less than two weeks. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and it would have been paid leave while the investigation continues. Right. And, and I, I hear you on that. You know, it really brings back home what it means to be a Black man in America. On both sides, the young man that was beaten to death, and you got these police officers over here 
that are professionals and they let their emotions get a hold of them that day, unfortunately. You know, mm. one is gone and the others, their careers are done. Right. We got to understand that rules are different for us versus anybody else. Obviously, it's different for whites. It's different even for Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Because we have darker skins. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, I've had a couple of people that work for me that say, hey, you know what? It's not as bad for me because my skin is lighter. Even though I'm black, my skin is lighter. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you're a black male and your skin is dark and you're big, that means you're intimidating. And that means a lot of people are scared to work with you, hire you and do a number of other things. So you got to make yourself so that when you're talking to someone that is a hiring manager, hiring person, you got to make it so that you know how to talk to them in a way that doesn't intimidate them. It shouldn't be that way. No one else, no white male thinks about trying to make sure they're uh, talking to someone and not trying to intimidate them. But yeah. we have to understand that. I was uh, invited to speak to a group of Black men in the UK about conducting these interviews of Black American males. And hearing them share the exact same experiences, right? Not wanting to be seen as the angry Black man. It was something about hearing it from across the Atlantic. Black men are feared, period. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to laugh, but it's like a nervous laughter that, you know, that walking down the street, people are like, oh, oh, oh. When you walk into a boardroom, oh, oh. And more importantly, what I got was how much work there is managing other people's fears. Yeah. That, that being out is a continual managing for other people's misplaced fear. And so I hear you pointing to that as well. Can you share an interaction or two that you've had with law enforcement? And I always tell guests, it's not about that you have to share something bad because some people share some funny ones or some interesting ones or kind ones, but it, it's just overall, this gives listeners, um, when this project is complete with 365 Brothers, from across the U.S., they're going to see the pattern of racial profiling that goes beyond, and not every person has that experience. So can you share your interactions with law enforcement? Have I been stopped? Yes. Have I been uh, stopped and pulled over and told to get out of the car and get up against the uh, hood of the car? Uh, yes. Uh, searched? Yes. Told to lay on the ground? Yes. And this has happened when I was not just a teenager, but a professional. And I'm thinking as uh, the last time it happened, it was years ago, the last time it happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe as you get older, uh, they say this is an old guy, so it's, he's maybe not as threatening. The last time I did it, I was a vice president. And yeah. I'm laying on the ground because, well, there was someone that looked like you that just committed this robbery, it just so happens that I was a black man that you decided to stop because there had been a robbery, uh, not that looked like me, because you didn't know what I looked like when I was in the car. Mm -hmm. and, and so you couldn't have, you couldn't have gotten that good a look at me. Right. And so it's just you're randomly stopping black man. So, you know, I had to go through that humiliation of uh, lying on the ground, people walking and seeing that and wondering what I had done and that kind of thing. Did it make me mad? Yes, it did. So those are the kind of interactions I've had. And then I've had the normal interactions where I was mm -hmm. speeding or whatever. I've had those interactions and justifiably so. Uh, yeah. Should have been stopped. Uh, yeah. But I've probably been stopped that way whereby I either had to get out of the car and be searched or on the ground probably about four times in my life. I grew up in South Central LA also. 
I was always back over there because of my mother until 2017 when she passed away. So yeah. I was always back over in that area. So, you know, I know you're based out of Orange County, which is, for those who don't know, it's the county south of Los Angeles County. It's more diverse now, but it wasn't always. <laughs> it's not that diverse. It's less than 1% Black in Orange County. Really? Now? Right now, less than 1%. I stand corrected. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. And I have to be careful because it's uh, very tough for a lot of Black kids in this environment. It's so few of them at the schools that they attend. And a lot of these teachers don't know how to handle having a Black student in their class. Sometimes that Black student that's in their class is the first Black student they've ever had. And mm -hmm. things that go on that a Black student can end up be getting blamed for are wrong because mm -hmm. it, it didn't happen the way it's being said. And I uh, belong to a group of Black professionals. We would get together uh, three to four times a year, talk through things that we could do to help each other, things that uh, were going on with our families, our kids, especially in that environment. And every single one of them who have Black male kids have had issues, every single one that weren't justified. And I'm not talking about them being biased or anything, they just were not justified. Not nearly, hardly any for Black females, uh, mm -hmm. children, but for their males, every single one of them has, through the years, had major issues with the uh, uh, schools that they attended. Wow. I appreciate you putting that in. And as an educator, I, I know the truth of it. They've they literally had to retrain teachers on how to do discipline to not. And I and I'm in a very diverse community. And even within our diverse community where you're you're going to have plenty of black and brown students. But that bias is so real. And it's as little as, you know, the student says, I don't have to. And she was being defiant and threatening when it's on, you know, a person of color. And then for the other person, oh, Jenny had a bad day, <laughs> you know? Yep. So thank you for sharing that. I, I do have just one question. The reason I brought up or Orchana, I'm just curious, when you were stopped as vice president and, you know, asked to lay on the ground, was that Orange County or L.A.? Just L.A. Okay. Uh -huh. One time, it's funny. I see. Uh, when I had left Xerox, I went with another firm here in Orange County for a couple of years. And this was early when we moved back from Rochester, New York to California in Orange County. Mm -hmm. That stopped. And he was very uh, kind of had his hand close to his gun the whole time when he came up to the car and asked for my registration. And I was a senior VP of this company in Irvine, and he said, okay, he went, this is not your registration, et cetera. I said, yes, my uh, stepfather uh, had passed away, and I'm using his car, and he said, well, where do you work? And then I said, where I work, he kind of stopped in his tracks and said, okay, have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because the company was well known in Orange County and I was number two there. So it was bye. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that but, something? But uh, otherwise it would have been different. <laughs> I already know. I already know. We can laugh about it, but it's, you know, for those who get stopped and they don't have the things that terminate <laughs> their police interaction, it's anyway. Um, thank you for sharing all, all of that. Andre, if the United States was a woman with whom you could speak, what would you say to her? Justice is not blind. It's not fair. You need to change the way justice is uh, done in this country. And you also need to change the way fairness, things that are done from a fairness standpoint, mm. 
happen in this country with people of color. Yeah. And that's not just blacks, but black males more so than any other, but mm -hmm. also happens with Hispanics and Asians. It, it needs to change. And that's what I would say. I mean, basically, it's not justice is blind or whatever. I, it's not. And you look at juries, what do you see on those juries? Not your peers. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's so many folks, some, yeah, guilty, like in every situation, but many aren't. But depending on how much money they have for an attorney or didn't have, and depending on what that DA was going for, and then that jury, that judge, they weren't judged by their peers. Yeah. No, that has a ripple effect because that affects not just them, but their kids, the grandkids, and so on and so on. It has an effect. It, it's it's mind blowing. You know, when you said some of them are, many are not innocent, I know that there might be listeners who go, I don't know about many. And I'm not going to, I don't know a number, but I do know that if you check out that video, the front line, and I think you can YouTube it, the plea, you will see how even without a trial, the unfairness of it, um, because it really comes down to their having ineffective counsel because they can only afford a public defender who's too busy to even know them. Anyway. Well, let's talk about love, which also ain't fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to name any names, but I'm just saying it wasn't always fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is a moment that exemplifies love to you? And I know, you know, it's hard to just pick one. So we're not saying this is the best moment, the best example of love, but just one that exemplifies love for you? Well, I'm not going to talk about women in my life. I'm going to talk oh. about the, the best example of that was probably when my son was born. And he's 19 now. And what I did when he was born, quite frankly, I made him the center of my life to a large degree. When he was five years old and started kindergarten, I would take him to school and pick him up. And I did that all the way through until he got his driver's license. Then he kicked me to the side. Are you kidding me? Nope. I took him to school. I would uh, pick him up. I, uh, he had issues in the school, in the school district he was in, in the fourth grade. So I put him into a chartered school in San Diego. And so day I would drive to San Diego, stick around San Diego until school got out and take him home for a year and a half until I could get him into a charter school in Orange County. And so I was making that drive from Orange County to San Diego each day and then back. Sometimes I would have to make it twice because I needed to be back into the office for a key appointment. It really restricted, quite frankly, how much time I spent at work. I made him the most important thing in, in my life. And so... It was something I don't regret. Uh, the only thing I will say is that, like a lot of Black fathers, one thing I would tell fathers that are in their 30s and 40s uh, that have kids now that are elementary school becoming teenagers, make sure you're not giving them too much growing up because it's tough out there for them. It's probably tougher than it was for me because there are less things. We can call it affirmative action or anything else. Companies, quite frankly, were looking for Blacks to hire in the mm -hmm. 70s and 80s. They're not looking for that today. Okay, that is definitely not a priority. And not just from that perspective, but it is going to be much tougher for these kids than it was for them or their fathers. Or And so they can't, cuddle their kids so much that they're not able to fight through it because you yeah. a black male has to be tough they have to understand and i don't mean fighting fighting obviously no. right but they got to be tough enough 
to know how to navigate the field, navigate the game. That's it is a game out there. Mm-hmm. And you'll get so many games played on you. And if you're not careful, they will overtake and overwhelm you. They got to know how to do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's all I can say is exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Okay. But I'm out here. I know the distance, but for someone who's listening on the East Coast or the Midwest, Orange County to San Diego, we're talking, what is that, like 60 miles? Uh, about It was about 50 miles each way. 50 miles each way. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> Every day. He was, he was the priority. I mean, either a Starbucks or a Regis uh, uh, workplace center and work there until he got out of school. Wow. That is commitment. It's love, but it, it that's that's committed love. The last question I have is what's something that you could share from your professional opinion? And we haven't actually talked about wealth management yet. Or I mean, it's kind of come in in and out of the conversation, but what would you share? Well, let me take it a little more broader and I'll bring it back. Sounds good. First of all, people coming out of college today, hopefully, I always tell people, though the same thing to my son. Number one, I hope and wish you could invent something that uh, it would be uh, you can bring to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Number one, forget about school, forget about college, invent something. Now, if you Mm -hmm. can't, go to school. Hey, absolutely. (laughs) I'm right with you. You know, the Michael Dells, the Bill Gates, and what's his name with Facebook, all, none of these guys graduated from college. Mm -hmm. Okay. So invent something. If you can't go to college, okay, go get a job at a, at a good company. And it doesn't have to be the biggest company, but a good company that has a great training program and great processes. Mm -hmm. By, you know, that's hard to figure out when you're a kid coming out of uh, college and whatever, but you have to really do your research. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so important to get that background and that beginning so that five to 10 years later, five preferably, you go out and do something on your own. Do not stay there 30 and 40 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't get rich being a W-2 employee. Mm-hmm. You know, people that get rich being a W-2 employee is the CEO and sometimes the CFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe a few executive vice presidents and whatever. Sure. But you don't get rich being a W-2 employee for the most part. Not totally, but for the most part. And that's for your working career. But you want to figure out what you have a passion for during that time, what you feel you're good at, and through that time, start working on your plan, your the overall business plan, the marketing plan, the structure, and whatever, so that you're ready when you do go out there and launch it, versus waiting until you leave and then start working on it. Work on it early. Mm-hmm. Now, that's hard to do because we're so busy and having fun and doing the day-to-day stuff. It's hard to do, but that's Mm -hmm. what I want to do. After that, from a wealth management standpoint, the issue with Black Americans, we have the lowest wealth level of anyone. We don't do the things we need to do to create wealth and to maintain wealth and to pass it on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that. As a, mm-hmm. overall, right. the lowest ones. There are a lot of different ways you can do that. One of the things that when you're looking at wealth creation and when you're looking at how you pass things on, it's really not about what you get in marketplace returns in the stock market or whatever, quite frankly, that's mm-hmm. important, but that's not the ultimate thing. It's all about what you keep, give to the government. Uh, you got to minimize taxes along the way. You got to minimize taxes 
to the next generation. The things that people use, to, there's new strategies that have to be developed and are being developed because a couple of years ago, until a couple of years ago, if in fact you left a $10 million uh, uh, IRA, and there are some that big because it was from a rollover from a corporate rollover. Yeah. That person could stretch whoever inherited, could stretch it out over their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now you have to uh, take it all out within 10 years, which mm -hmm. significantly increases taxes. Right. During that time, uh, time period, or what's going to happen is you're not going to have money 15 and 20 years later because of how much you had to take out in a 10-year period versus your lifetime. So there's a lot right. of different things that I know a lot of us don't have $10 million, to use that as an example. But no matter what it is, there are things we could be doing a lot better that can create wealth, enough wealth for you now to live comfortably, but more importantly, for your kids, grandkids, you can start that strategy so that hopefully it gets carried forward from generation to generation. And that's what we've been lacking because if you go back to World War II, GI Bill, uh, where you could uh, buy a house under the GI Bill, the issue under the GI Bill, you still got to get a loan. And they um, loans for houses to black GIs. Um, so we didn't have that home lack of owning homes and all yeah. the foundation to start with. And so it's just carrying on from generation to generation. We have not had that base. And at some point, hopefully, we will start building that base so that we can carry on from generation to generation. I'm so glad you do the work you do. My uh, firm is in Irvine, California. Uh, if you ever want to go to my uh, website, it's hwmg-lpl.com. And if you ever want to reach me by phone, love to hear from people. 949-222-6401. Uh, uh, with that, um, my uh, firm is in Irvine, California. Uh, if you ever want to go to my uh, website, it's hwmg-lpl.com. And if you ever want to reach me by phone, love to hear from people. 949-222-6401. Uh, All of his information is in the show notes. Before we uh, do that, I have one last question, and that is, Andre, what did you get for yourself out of participating in this conversation? Well, what I get got for myself is I just like a lot of the comments you made. I've learned uh, things from your comments. Um, I think uh, important that someone such as yourself is doing a show like this. You know, it's important for us to continue talking, uh, but not only talk, but we have to help the 25 and 30 year olds understand what are the things in 40, in 40 year olds, and even older, because we have to help them open the doors, break down yeah. barriers. Uh, and that's just something that we have to uh, continue doing. And what I got from this show is that this is one of the tools that we can use to do that with. Oh, why, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm always left with an impression of each brother, something that stands out about them. And for me, it is using your genius. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's what you represent for me is, you know, it's one thing to have genius, right? Like, and I, and I should say that I believe every person has an area in their life where they're a genius. And so with you being creative and problem solving, right, it's just you apply that everywhere. That fun that you had at Xerox, the way that you saw what other people couldn't see, and even in what you're doing with wealth management. I know that wealth management requires foresight and genius in seeing things that others may not notice. 
And so I just acknowledge you for putting your genius in action and sharing that genius so that other people can reap the rewards. And that's the last thing I'll say is one of the other things that stands out about you is that in all the instances where you have built either wealth from others in your business and wealth management or around Xerox, you really enjoy having other people enjoy that ride. Who doesn't want to be a part of the team like that, where, where the person who's leading also is invested, not just in that you get it done, but that you enjoy getting it done. It's fun getting it done. And they want to share that success. And so thank you for being someone who loves sharing your success with others. One other thing I just want to add, I want to make clear. Yes. Uh, I didn't do all this by myself. There were a lot of people that came before me, even at Xerox. Okay. Yeah. Whose backs I stood on. I bring people behind me, yes, but I stood on a lot of people's backs mm. uh, to get to the next level and the level I got to. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. Certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love.